foraging doesn't need to be daunting. You really can start small. Welcome to the Eden Podcast, where we bring you deep dive interviews unlocking mastery that will transform your relationship to food and why we should eat in. How did you get into foraging? My uncle was very interested in the book by Yule Gibbons, Stalking the Wild Asparagus. And when he would come visit, we would hike and look for plants that we could nibble. After that, I really wanted to keep foraging. So I had a couple of books um, and as a teenager, and but I really would only try the plants that I could identify well. I didn't know that much about plants, so I went for the really obvious ones and I had a couple things as a teenager that I would eat and feed to people and cool. so forth. Yeah. Yeah. What well, what were those things? Sure. Well, one that uh, sticks in my mind is called sumac. Uh, mm -hmm. Plant that I used to forage was staghorn sumac. So the, the sumacs that look like small trees uh, with thin trunks, they look kind of mm -hmm. tropical. Leaves are these cone-shaped clusters of small dry red berries and staghorn mm. sumac berries are very fuzzy those little red berries can be dried um pulverized and sifted to make a spice uh, when mm. i was young i didn't make the spice but i made something called sumac lemonade where you would take the Ooh. clusters soak them in cold water because the berries are very sour and then mm. you would get this sour liquid that you could then sweeten huh like lemonade you know yeah yep. is it kind of like a i feel like hibiscus kind of has like a sourness to it is it kind of similar to that yeah i'm trying to Not think I, I mean the sumac is quite sour like lemon okay. sour so if okay. you get it you know you have to forage it uh you know the rain can wash out the sourness so you want to taste the clusters before you forage them um but yeah like like sour patch kids tart um Whoa, when they're okay. good. so more wow. so i would say than hibiscus and i just want to uh, obligatory caution here people who are highly allergic to cashews may mm. react to the sumax it's really not common oh. but it could happen so wow while we're talking about it yeah yeah no most definitely that's a good segue into my next question which is essentially like you know there's so many um identifying right poisonous versus edible, et cetera, it can be kind of challenging. So first, how did you learn how to do that? And two, how, how do you do that? <laughs> sure. So, and I'll preface too by saying, do we have plants that are so poisonous they could kill you? Yes, but we don't have very many of them. Um, and the second point I'd like to say is that, you know, most people don't misidentify, they, most people don't mistake an edible a poisonous plant for an edible plant because mm. they've made no effort to identify it. So I want to dispel some fears. Um, foraging is an age old pastime and, you know, throughout human history, people around the world have foraged for wild. Yeah, so I mean, you can start with known plants, like most of us can identify a dandelion. Uh, but after mm. that, you know, I just started pouring through the wild edible plant books. And so sometimes I'd read about a plant and I really wanted to find it and I'd go looking for it. Uh, and sometimes mm. I would have just paged through a whole book and then gone for a hike. That looks like the right plant. So <laughs> right. that's... um. What a good friend of mine, Sam Thayer, who writes about edible wild plants, would call that then the tentative identification. You're not, that's not a positive identification. It's not time to make a salad yet, you know. Um, sure. <laughs> yeah, but then that's what you have guidebooks for. So you have edible plant books and you also have just generalist plant books. So you should look mm. up that plant in a couple of books and compare the written descriptions with your observation of the plant in the field. Compare mm -hmm. the um, pictures with the plant. And you want to be 100% sure that you have the right plant before you taste it. 
but it's yeah. it's not as hard as you might think. I mean, and it, if you take a class, it can kind of give you a shortcut to some of those plants. Sure. But in the end, it's just one plant at a time. You know, mm. okay, I'm 100% sure about this one plant and now I want to try it. And maybe I'll just try a little bit the first time and, and see how it affects yeah. me. Try some more the next time. And, um, yeah. you know, at this point, there's such an explosion of resources about edible wild plants on the internet that you can yeah. look for recipe ideas. You can read other people's experiences. There really are a lot of great resources out there right now. So, yeah, most definitely. But for me, it was one plant at a time. One plant I learned, tried tried to find something that I liked that I could make with it, tried to make my husband like <laughs> that he would eat, <laughs> right. that he would actually eat if I put it on the plate. You know, that was a good right. sign <laughs> that I did well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I think it's, you know, it's really interesting. Um, there's so many, so many foods in our grocery stores, right? And I think there are a lot of people that even have trouble crafting recipes out of these kind of known foods, right? And yet you've been able to really craft these amazing recipes, very creative off of, you know, foods that we typically don't eat and different flavor profiles. And I mean, you're turning a lot of them into like powders and just really cool things that the average person, you know, doesn't, doesn't probably think of. So how did you kind of lean into this creativity like do you have any inspiration there or are is that just like a source of play for you my parents cook and they cook well but they don't come from a culinary education background so um i i often joke that my motivation for learning how to cook has come from edible wild plants because i find wow. a plant and i'm so motivated to learn how i can use it yeah. Then I start, you know, searching for ideas. And so as far as somebody who's got a new plant that they're, okay, how do I make this into food? Like, here are some of the things that, some of the approaches I take. A lot of times plants, uh, wild plants are similar to some cultivated plants, not always, mm -hmm. but, you know, for example, there's a plant called lamb's quarter that's found in gardens and disturbed areas. And it acts, it's closely related to spinach. And so mm. you can use it like a spinach and think, okay, what would I put my spinach in? Well, I would steam it and have it as a side dish, or I might throw it in a quiche or a frittata, mm. or I might make sag paneer if I'm trying to make an Indian dish, you know? So some plants, um, you can take your cues from cultivated plants. Not mm. always, but that's, that's one approach. And then, you know, another approach that I like to take, if it's a non-native species, if it's new to the U.S., um, mm. I like to track it back to its land of origin and see wow. what do the people over there use it for? What recipes yeah. can I find? And so that's mm. led me to some really good... Um, ideas as well but yeah i have to say also you're right it is also a creative outlet for me i'm like yeah okay what what can i make with this that's interesting and new so. and yummy yeah totally i when i was like five i had a cooking show for my friends and family and i would make everything that was probably not edible to them they would they would have to try it but it was just ever since that time the kitchen for me has been the source of just experimentation play creativity it's just really fun for me and there's this desire to share that with others right to because there's sure. so many people I think that you know get kind of challenged in the kitchen they don't they don't know how to do it they don't feel like they have the time to do it and to spark any sort of inspiration I think is awesome one thing that I try to do is that for each plant that I find mm -hmm. and learn how to pick and and so forth I try to find at least one preparation and it could be simple. It could be a salad, you know, that I know yeah. I will eat that plant that way every time. And my husband will mm. too. It's that base recipe, the really simple, the not too many ingredients that yeah. um, makes a difference between a plant that is just a novelty and something useful to me in the kitchen. Right. Yeah. Keeping it simple, I think is always a good way to go. Um, I love your going back to the, that original land that might have cultivated those plants. And so are you finding, you know, material and resources in terms of research, like 
through any specific books for that? Or like, how do you go about that, that discovery? Sure. So I am a big ethnobotany nerd. <laughs> I love <laughs> so reading ethnobotanies and you can find a lot of ethnobotanical papers online at Google mm. Scholar. So one of my approaches is to go to Google Scholar and type in the scientific name of the plant and type in the word ethnobotany. And I found a lot of ethnobotanies from Europe and Asia that describe how traditional peoples who either recently were still using the plant or are still using the plant mm -hmm. use that plant. Because, you you know, a lot of foraging practice has diminished just in the last 100 mm -hmm. years around the world. But there are still plenty of people out there using wild foraged plants whose whose parents and grandparents foraged wild food plants. Um, so you, wow. you often hear of the, the Mediterranean diet. And so you know, mm -hmm. in, in Greece, um, in Italy, there are people collecting spring greens, like lots of different spring mm -hmm. greens for, for, um, for a pie, a savory pie with greens or for a sure. spring soup or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. So cool. Okay. Google Scholar. I have to check that out. And actually, let me say one more thing, too, because I just was, I was mainly talking about non-native plants or plants sure. that arrived here kind of with or after uh, settlers from around the world, but yeah. also uh, indigenous plants in North America, plants that predated um, that wave of settlement uh, also mm -hmm. have obviously been long used by myriad indigenous groups around the country, um, many of whom still use edible wild plants. And there's also a great database by Daniel Mormon that uh, mm. you can type in a scientific name and you can learn. It's the database of ethnobotany. So you can learn how various uh, peoples have used that plant. What are the health benefits of eating wild edible? Wild food is organic, generally being picked and consumed quite soon after you've picked it. And so yeah. it doesn't have that long time in transit to lose nutrients. There's a lot of nutrient loss right. that happens from picking, especially when plants or vegetables are being picked under ripe. The same benefit can accrue from eating garden food if you have your garden, you know. Um, right. Another one that uh, I thought of is the microbiome. More and more research about the importance of the microbiome in regulating body function. That microbiota, those bacteria come from plants that we eat. But if you right. sterilize the plants before they come to the grocery store, then you're not getting, yeah, you're not getting that. And in fact, I have a friend, um, her name is Kelly Zeppelin, and she just got her PhD and she wrote about um, rewilding the gut through mm. eating edible wild plants. And I've been really oh, captivated wow. by that idea. There's also something about not, not just the plant, right? But getting the microbiome from the soil and being in contact with the soil, right? It's also good for your microbiome. That's my understanding too. It's why I stopped washing yeah. my vegetables so much. <laughs> right, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, a little dirt is good. <laughs> yeah. Do you have favorite edible plants or, you know, favorite of the seasons or or is there, you know, a favorite one that you have from like childhood or something, you know, when you go back to the East Coast you love to to check out? Oh gosh, I, I really like a lot of edible wild plants. And I, you know, I, I could say dandelion um, just because my backyard <laughs> makes really amazing dandelions that are like, I mean, they can be like a foot wow. wide in diameter. And oh my I, take, gosh. I take in a crop of dandelion greens every season oh. and I make a soup that wow. I really love with them. Um, mm. But I, I could come up with some other ideas too. But yeah, I live at 10,000 feet. <laughs> In Colorado, 10,000 feet in elevation. Yeah. So I think our dandelions just don't get bitter as fast, perhaps, or maybe I don't oh. mind a little bit of bitterness, but just sure. love my dandelions. Love them. In Colorado, we also get these little um, blueberry relatives that I call huckleberries, and some people would be uh, unhappy that I called huckleberries, but they're very <laughs> sure. closely related to blueberries and they have a little stamp in the end, but they don't have the crown. They're these little tiny berries and they're they're in the ground cover um, from like the Aspen level, the montane level up into the mm. subalpine and even above tree line. So you wow. probably walk 
through them in the late summer sure. and fall and not know there's berries there because they're kind of hiding yeah. under the foliage. So if you pick them up and look underneath, they're these tiny, really flavorful, really antioxidant packed, delicious berries. I've done a little bit of foraging myself, but I didn't know, you know, I had a couple guides, but I would take things home. And my then boyfriend was like, I don't think you should be eating these. So I kind of, I personally yeah. got a little bit scared and then didn't really follow through with connecting with a guide or someone to show me or, you know, diving back in the books, etc. But that being said, I, I've always wanted to kind of pick it back up and the, my favorite part about it, even though I didn't get anything that was securely edible, right? My favorite part about it was just being outside and that like discovery of something that, I mean, to, in my experiences weren't even edible, right? But it was still fun to find something. And um, how does that, I mean, I think there are so many health benefits from just the outdoor exposure. And from your you know experience, what is that like? experience experiential part how does that play into like your love of foraging sure yeah i i i'm right there with you it is a great excuse to spend time outdoors in nature to explore i love the sense of discovery i love the adventure i mean and i often find something different than what i maybe set out to look for but still fantastic there's plenty mm. of research that talks about spending time in nature being positive for our, our emotional and mental well-being yeah. um and i i think it i think it slows us down too i mean picking things you have to slow yeah. down you can't you can't always do that quickly in japan they talk about forest bathing right and how you know they they just go out there and they essentially bathe in the with the trees and the positive effects that have has on de-stressing and all of these number of things which I think a lot of us are cooped up in our offices and our homes etc and you know a little bit of outdoor exploration is um, just welcomed I think for everyone you teach a class in edible medicinal and tool craft plan. For many of us, when we get a headache or sore throat, we resort to like over the counter medication. But I think for most, we don't actually know like how it's made or what's in, in, in the medicine. So what role do medicinal plants play in, in your life? I dabble. I, I, don't, I teach that one class um, for a local college and I'm using an established curriculum. Um, but but yeah, I haven't been to herbalism school, although that could be on the list. Um, cool. At some point, at some point, yeah. But, yeah. So you can use your wild foods as a lot of wild foods double as medicines, right? There's a fine line between food and medicine. Um, and so, uh, you know, even just drinking dandelion root tea or dandelion leaf tea can have a detoxifying effect. So you can make medicines just by making a tea or a strong tea. I do have a lot of tinctures and I used to get a lot of colds. So I used to get mm. congested a lot. I used to have chest congestion a lot. And um, there were some wild medicines that I would use. I would use a tincture made of something called sticky gum weed, which is a helpful decongestant that, I mean, it's as simple as picking the sticky buds and putting them in alcohol and putting it in a dark place and shaking it, you know, every couple of days well, yeah. to make the tincture. <laughs> wow. um, uh, and, you know, I, I never really did evaluate, like, does this work better than, I don't know, what's that decongestant, mucinex or something that you Right, ago, Sudafed or take. something, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to think what else. Uh, elderberry. Elderberry is a nice, um, I mean, that's used in cough drops. It's used in right. in natural medicines. And so I have a tincture of elderberry. And if I think mm. I'm coming down with a cold, I'll start taking it to reduce the length of the cold, to ease the symptoms. Mm. Yeah, those are a couple of medicines I've used. We've talked about a little bit um, wild plants as cancer prevention. Is it, is it mainly just the mushrooms that you're using for that, or are there a few other things as well? Dandelion is supposed to be a good detoxifier, and I do drink a lot of dandelion tea and dandelion mm. leaf tea. In terms of the dandelion tea, it, I mean, it sounds like you love dandelion, which is awesome. <laughs> and so I wonder, do you... Do you dry some of it and then use it for tea throughout the year? Or what does that, that look like? Because I'm assuming, unless you have dandelions all, all year round. <laughs> sure. No, no. Yeah, you're absolutely right. That is that is what I do. So first of all, when I'm weeding my garden, I'll pull out the roots and chop up, you know, wash the roots and chop them up and dry those. 
So those can be brewed directly into a tea. I also dry the leaves and I make those into a tea and that's a bitter tea, but I crave it. I crave it every spring, really? especially. You can make it from fresh or dried leaves. So sure. I, I started drying them and yes, it's bitter, but I add a little lightener, a little something to sweeten and I just love it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And so you said you crave it in spring. Is it is that the main season that you're craving it? <laughs> Somehow, yeah, I really do yeah. want. I, it, 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 it does seem that when the dandelions are at their peak and when I am harvesting them, um, and I harvest a lot of dandelions to put up for winter too, just for a vegetable. So I'll, mm. I'll take in my big harvest of dandelion greens before the flowers start going off. And um, yeah. I will use some in soup and then I will blanch and freeze a lot of it. So I'll, I'll chop it up, wow. drop it into boiling water for a couple minutes, pull them out, shock them in cold water, squeeze out the liquid and freeze them. So mm. then I have that leftover cooking liquid and it's wow. dandelion tea, <laughs> wow. seriously strong dandelion tea. But it just yeah. does feel like in spring when things are starting to green up and here the snow is melting, that I want to drink a lot of dandelion tea. And, you know, mm. it is a little different now because we're in the age of the refrigerator and the grocery store. So, I mean, it's not like back in right. the day when people didn't have any greens all winter long and they couldn't wait to, you know, eat the greens right. and they were craving them and, and it would probably serve a detoxification. But still, I do find myself craving dandelion products. Most, <laughs> in yeah, spring, no, when they're in season, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me given, uh, you know, we have a seasonal course and we just talk about, you know, our bodies kind of know what we want and need during those different times of year, right? And so that that kind of cleansing spring and detoxifying, right, desire in our on our body kind of level, uh, I'm sure it's just speaking to you. <laughs> I'm learning more about seasonal eating. We've been really trained that we can get anything whenever we want, you know, and yes. and I'm I'm interested <laughs> in that subject. Yeah, most definitely. We can talk about it more later. <laughs> so you, you mentioned with the dandelions um, to you harvest them before you have before they start flowering. So if you harvest them after flowering, what, what is the difference there? Sure. I mean, and I'm not that's not to say you can't harvest them when they've started to produce flowers. But generally speaking, when the patch doesn't have many flowers pre flowering, the leaves are usually less bitter and less tough. Mm. So once everything starts flowering in earnest, I mean, just taste a leaf, you'll find it's it's more tough and it's um, and often more bitter. You know, when I make my soup, I a lot of people think dandelions are bitter, and they are. They're bitter, like endive is bitter too. Um, but yeah. when I make my soup, I do drop the dandelions into boiling water for a couple of minutes and pull them out, and then put them in the soup. And it does leach a little uh, bit of the bitterness out and also some nutrients. That's why I drink that cooking water afterwards. But, you know, wow, um, yeah, is a, is a way to make them a little less bitter. But, yeah, that's the prime foraging time for the greens. I mean, you can forage mm -hmm. the flowers after the flowers have been produced, you know. OK, so it sounds like we keep going back to this dandelion soup. What what else do you put in there? And it sounds like one of your favorites. <laughs> Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, yes. So the dandelion soup, and I have a recipe at my website at wildfoodgirl.com. Um, and I learned that from my uh, husband's father's wife, who is Italian. She grew up in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. and her grandparents would go out every every spring and collect dandelion greens and make this soup. And so I, I picked her brain and asked her, what was in it? What was the deal with that? And so they called it manesque. It's so simple. So in one pot, you're cooking a bunch of vegetables in a stock or not in a stock in water, and you're making a vegetable yeah. soup. In the other pot, you just drop in your chopped dandelions for two or three minutes until cooked, and then you pull right. them out. Now, if you're mm -hmm. a meat eater, um, Italian sausage fried up on the side is really good. Mm -hmm. And if you're a cheese eater, you know, a nice Parmesan is good too. And then you just plate sure. it all together. The veggie soup, put in a pile of dandelions, put your sausage and your ah. cheese on top. And so the the sausage yeah. balances a little bit of the dandelion's bitterness. It sounds kind of like you can build your own uh, depending on the day or the preference. And sound, I mean, it sounds kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think I touched on this before, but 
uh, foraging doesn't need to be daunting. It doesn't need to be this really uh, difficult, scary thing. You really can start small. Foraging is um, the, def the, the default mode for the world's peoples. I mean, you know, mm. some people have it in their recent history, some people in the uh, many generations ago, but we all have it in our history. Wild food wow. is the food we started with, you know, and so right. you can start with something like dandelions or learn one plant from a class or several books and start mm. small and go plant by plant. You don't have to graduate from dandelions for a year if you don't want to, you know, um, <laughs> but I, I, I would encourage people to give it a try. That's Erica, or better known as Wild Food Girl. You can find Erica at wildfoodgirl.com and follow her on Instagram at wild period food period girl. Thanks for listening to the show this week. I love answering any of your questions, so please feel free to send them to callycavanaugh.com slash questions. If you want to email me, you can do so at kelly at nonaeats.com. My Instagram account is at kellycavanaugh underscore. To join my digital courses, subscribe to my YouTube and newsletter for simple, healthy recipes, and learn more about Eat In, go to kellycavanaugh.com and check out the show notes for links. This episode was edited by Libby Gemperlein and recorded in Kiln. Kiln has an awesome soundproof recording room and flexible co-working spaces. So learn more at kiln.co.